Well, good morning, Encompass Church. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers here today. Hope you all are having a, a great day. Thanks so, so much for being here. I just pray uh, for God's uh, blessing and an encouragement over you today as fathers. Won't you all stand with me as we uh, get ready to enter into worship here? Uh, let me just open us up in prayer this morning. Father God, we just uh, we worship you today, God. We lift you up. Happy Father's Day to you, Father God. Lord, thank you so much for your heart for fathers, Lord. You even, you're the, you're the ultimate father, Lord, and you even gave Jesus an earthly father here, Lord. I know fathers are important to you, Lord, and um, you have a, a plan and a purpose for each father here today, Lord. Just pray for your encouragement uh, over all the fathers, and also pray for your comfort for all of those of us, God, who whose fathers have passed on, and maybe today is not, not the easiest day, too, because of that, Lord. But I just pray for your encouragement and for you to lift uh, each person up here today, Lord. And uh, we just worship you today. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. see is the battle you see my victory when all I see is the mountain you see a mountain move and as I walk through the shadow your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Almighty oh, fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Oh, almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Shine in the shadows. 
you win every battle nothing can stand against the power of our God so when I fight I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high oh God battle belongs to you every fear I lay at your feet I sing through the night oh God battle belongs to you oh God battle belongs to you darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the world from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross or even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation jesus for our sake you died the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born then the spirit in the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not fade. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise forever. 
I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire darkest night you were close like the other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God This is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able oh, I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so 
so good every breath that I am able oh I will sing the goodness of God yes I will sing the goodness of God I love that part in that song where it talks about your goodness is running after it's running after me that comes straight from the parable that Jesus shared you know we, we called the prodigal son that that parable could also be called the good father am I right even though the, the son wasted his inheritance, lived exactly how he wanted to live, and never really even repented. He just reasoned to himself. He said, you know what? My father's servants have it better than I do. I'm going to go back, and I'm going to tell him I'm going to be his servant. He never really said, I mean, he said, I sinned against you, uh, but he said, make me one of your servants. So he's still demanding of his dad, even when he comes back. But the father said, no, he... The father was looking for him. He was scanning the horizon. And it said he ran after his son and kissed him. Even though his son had screwed up big time, that's God's heart today. He's a good, good father. In spite of our shortcomings, in spite of, you know, it's, it's like there's times where we go, boy, I messed up or I didn't do this right. Or looking back, did I... Did I do right by my kids? In spite of that, God still says, I love you. I've got you. So I know as, as dads, a lot of times we feel that, that weight of responsibility on us, but know that you have a good father that comes alongside of you to carry you and to lead you every step of the way. So I just want to encourage all you guys in that today as we sing.
Deeper still as you call me Deeper still into love Love, you're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am God, you are a good, good father. We thank you so much for your love for, for us, God. Thank you, Lord, for going all the way, Lord, for looking for us, for pursuing us, God, not for being a God that stands back with his arms crossed, but a God whose arms are wide open and who pursues us because of his great love. We thank you for that, Lord. We just pray that you open our hearts to all that you have for us, God. Help us to have that realization of who you are and that you come alongside of us, Lord. We thank you for that now, and we just uh, pray over Pastor Kevin as he shares your word with us this morning. God, open our ears and open our hearts to all that you have for us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys. Well, I think the, do we have the kids. Yep, there it is. Kids, you guys are dismissed to go. That You'll see the sign in the back over here. You guys can do that, and the rest of you guys, just take a minute and greet some folks around you, and we'll get started here shortly. Good morning, Encompass Church. 
we could just do this all day. As the loud roar calms into a shallow murmur. Good morning, Encompass. My name is Cameron Yuliet, and I'm one of the elders here at Encompass, and uh, it's a privilege to worship God with you. Thank you for being here. Thanks, or uh, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. It's uh, great to see you, and thanks for sharing a part of your day here at Encompass. Um, we would love to keep in touch with you, uh, fathers and everyone else. Uh, one of the best ways that you can do that is to use the Connect card. It's in your um, welcome guide, and um, you can use that welcome guide in a myriad of ways. Uh, find out what's going on here at Encompass. I'm going to go through a couple of things that we have here uh, that are going on, but there's a lot more, and we want to direct your attention to uh, the welcome guide, but also to our website. Keep uh, up to date on what's going on. Uh, so in your welcome guide, there's a connect card. You can also go out online and fill that out. We'd love to know how we can pray for you. We can answer any questions that you might have. And uh, that's a great way to stay in touch. So please take advantage of that. Uh, if you are a guest, so some someone that has been here just a few times or uh, still getting to know Encompass, we'd love to invite you to something called guest reception. It happens uh, just after the service, 1030, 1045, in the room on the second level, just as you come in those main doors. Uh, this is a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about us as a church, to get some questions answered, to uh, hear from leadership, how we're led, what we believe, how we think, why we're doing what it is that we do. And so we'd encourage you to take advantage of that. Uh, there's food, and we also have classes for uh, kids and teens, so we've got you covered there. Uh, it's a four-week rotating class, so join anytime uh, for a couple of weeks just to get to know us and give us an opportunity to get to know you as well. On Friday, uh, or no, sorry, Friday. Friday? I heard a yes. I heard an amen in the back. Uh, Friday, June 24th, in the morning between, I can't read that, somebody help me, 8 and 11? 8 and 1. Whew, I need to get some class. I did pass the driver's test, though. <laughs> so I don't know whether that's good or bad. But um, Okay, so Friday, June 24th, from 8 to 1, uh, there's a blood drive that the, the proceeds will be going to Children's Hospital. <laughs> proceeds of a blood drive. <clears throat> uh, you can sign up on, the, on our website or you'll see some blood drive posters plastered around the building. There's a QR code and you can sign up for that as well. So Friday, June 24th uh, in the morning to one o'clock. Uh, one of the things in our uh, statement of faith is a, um, uh, a, a, that life is precious and it's precious from the moment of conception to death. And uh, we're honored and privileged here to host a seminar on uh, Saturday, the 25th, from or at, at about 10 o'clock, uh, to be an hour, two, two hours around. Um, and this talks about abortion, it talks about uh, life development, and it really gives folks an opportunity to understand uh, what life is all about from the beginning. And uh, if you're ever faced with a situation where you have to counsel someone who is considering an abortion, this gives you some information, some uh, tips and, and uh, facts to counsel them against that. And so uh, there's a lot going on in the abortion world. Uh, we've got a Supreme Court decision due out sometime this month, and uh, there's also Colorado has a lot going on in the legislature. So there will be a legislative update, there will be a legal update, but it really is focused on life development. What does that look like, and how can we as a church support and, uh, and encourage life? And so 10 o'clock on Saturday, June 25th, um, I'd really like to encourage um, teens to come and do this as well. But there is mature content 
it's a pretty heavy course or uh, seminar. I went uh, a couple of months ago and, and heard this exact talk. And uh, if you're a parent, I, you need to come with your team. Uh, it's, it's heavy, but it's also really, really important. So consider that uh, Saturday the 25th at 10 a.m. Um, Dan, why don't you come on up? Um, we are privileged here at Encompass to uh, support both financially and prayerfully uh, a portfolio of wonderful missionaries. And Dan and Melinda Nelson are one of them. We've supported you for years and years, and you've held a lot, of, a variety of positions, uh, church planner both in the United States as well as um, in Mexico. And now you have a new position, which I'm going to ask you about here in a second. But Dan and Melinda Nelson are wonderful missionaries, uh, effective in their calling, and um, we just couldn't be more happy to have you here today. Thank you. Um, at 12:30, this is a little plug for our potluck that's happening, uh, 12.30 here today, um, 12.15, just after the, the second hour classes. Uh, we're gonna be meeting in this room right back here. If you brought something great, if you didn't bring something and, and still wanna come, I'd encourage you to come. Uh, but Dan, I wanted to have you introduced to the congregation and learn a little bit more about who you are. So tell us what your current role is and uh, just what is it that you and Melinda are doing? Uh, five years ago, uh, we were asked by our mission organization, which is Converge International Ministries, to give leadership to our work in Latin America. So right now, we give leadership to, we have 20 missionaries in seven different countries. Uh, we work out of Guadalajara, Mexico, and, uh, and we, we serve those missionaries and, and uh, just uh, support them and, and give a little bit of leadership. But for the rest of us, that's Guadalajara, right? Well, Oh, okay. <laughs> your 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 uh, Spanish is way too good. Way too good. Anyway, um, Dan, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, a, a recent um, uh, praise story. Something that that we can be encouraged by and learn from. Uh, tell us about something that's happened that's been really good. Uh, so we started ministry, uh, actually some of you may know Mike Huber. He was the one that first gave me my first job in the ministry and hired me as a church planner in the Denver area. Um, we planted two churches in the Denver area. One of them we started in 2000. And there was a couple that came to faith in Christ, Raul and Nena. Uh, and they came to Christ through our ministry. Uh, grew. We actually left that church in 05. A year ago, they called me up and asked me if I was gonna be in town around June of 2022, of this year, because they have a special needs daughter. Uh, she's turning 15 years old, and that's a big deal in Latin American culture. So they wanted to do a quinceanera and asked me to come and give the, the just kind of officiate at the ceremony. So I got together with them, uh, talked through with them what they wanted me to communicate, uh, and about three Saturdays ago, uh, we were there. They had brought 300 people came. And uh, I was able to share with them their words about Samarita is not a mistake. She's a creation, a beautiful creation of God. And how she has a direct connection with God. She's not able to speak verbally. Uh, but uh, that they wanted to make sure that everybody else could have that connection with God. And so I was able to share the gospel there. Uh, Raul is an elder in the church. And it's just so encouraging to see someone who we invested in 20 years ago. And you are a part of that because you've been partners with us during that time. And it's just so, we're so appreciative that we get to have experiences like that and to see God's changing and transformation in the lives. Uh, Raul and Nena, their son, Raulito and Samarita, and how God has worked in their lives. So that was just something that just filled our heart our love tanks about two weeks ago. But we know that ministry is not always easy. There are challenges. And so, uh, so that we can join alongside you in, uh, in prayer. Um, what are, what's one or two things that we can lift up to the Lord on your behalf and alongside you? Uh, we, I'm going to give actually three, but they all begin with peace. So you can remember, pray for protection, uh, pray for people, we're asking for more workers and pray for partners. Uh, 
we're going after about 70 million people in Latin America that yet need the gospel. And, uh, and just we need, we need partners. We need people to come alongside. If you're interested in going to Latin America and serve as a missionary, come talk to us afterwards and have a good meal. Yeah, I would encourage you to take advantage of this missions up or the missions potluck opportunity, whether you're brought a dish or not. I would love to have you. Great, thank you, Dan. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate it. Let's pray. Oh. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Dan and Melinda for all of the work that they do, for your provision in their life for the inspiration and encouragement that they are to me and to others at Encompass and around the world. We, uh, we lift up their prayer requests for people, for partners. Uh, we just ask that you provide. As they continue their time here in the States, I also ask that you give them rest despite the hectic schedule of visiting, supporting partners. Uh, build them up so that they can more effectively do your work. We thank you that for all that you have provided for them, and we ask your special blessing upon them for uh, physical protection, for financial provision, for relational stability, and above all, in spiritual ways that connect them to you. Lord, we're so thankful for the giving faithfulness of this church body to both our operations here, uh, but also as we support missionaries around the world. In here in Elizabeth and Parker and Franktown, we ask you to bless the tithes and offerings received this week and direct us in the ways that we can best use them to bring the most people to a saving relationship in Christ and to deepen the Christ likeness of those who have already depended and continue to depend on you. Now, as we shift into the next phase of worship, I ask that you open our ears to what it is that you have to say through Kevin this morning. Bless him and deliver your words and bless us as we receive them and put them into action. In Christ's name, we ask these things. Amen. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate that. Good morning. Happy Father's Day to all the dads and grandfathers out there. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Kevin Clark. I'm the pastor here at Encompass Church. And this is week three of a four-week series that we have been calling Reboot. It's June and summer is here. And if you're like me, oftentimes your brain tells you that you need some kind of a break during the summer months, right? You need some time to get outside. You need some time to spend with family and friends that maybe you haven't been able to uh, spend as much time with uh, during the rest of the year. You need time to just rest and sometimes reflect and reevaluate and recharge. And so summer is that season that I think mentally uh, we tell ourselves is a good time to kind of reboot. And summer's also really a good time for a church to reboot. The school year's over, so things have shifted into a new season. Um, and there's just a sense that some of the pressure is let out of the balloon. And so we get a chance to refocus our priorities and remind ourselves what's essential and what is not. And so that's what we're doing in this series is we're rebooting and sh just going back to the basics, the things that make us who we are. Now, our mission statement says this, Encompass Church exists to honor God by developing more disciple-making followers of Jesus Christ. So our mission is to make more followers of Jesus. But that raises a very obvious question, and the question is, is what is a follower of Jesus, and what does he or she do? And so we've summarized four of the major things that we think we are called to do as a church, as followers of Jesus, and put them into our vision statement. And our vision statement says our vision is to be a place where people discover a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ, connect with caring, like-minded fellow believers, grow in spiritual, emotional, and relational maturity, and serve each other, the local community, and the world. So there's four simple ideas there, to discover, to connect, 
to grow and to serve. And we all know the definitions of those words and what we think they mean, but when we put those ideas into the hands of Jesus Christ, he begins to transform us using those four activities and to make us more and more the people he has called us to be. So we're going to talk about that transformation, another piece of that, by looking at Luke chapter 9. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app and you'd like to follow along, you can go ahead and turn or scroll to that place. Uh, Two weeks ago, we talked about what Jesus does when you discover a vibrant relationship with him. He changes your head, he changes your heart, and he changes your hands. And then last week, we looked at what it means to connect with caring, like-minded fellow believers. It means we associate with each other in meaningful, non-superficial ways. And together, we consecrate ourselves to God. And today, we're going to unpack what it means to grow in maturity in the life of a Christ follower. I seem to have lost control of my slides. So could you advance? Thank you very much. Do you ever wonder why um, there are some people that maybe they're in this church, maybe they're people you know personally uh, that just seem to have an edge on spiritual maturity? They seem to have moved up further down the road than you or I, and they seem to have some kind of a secret. Is it actually a secret? It's not. It requires some significant work, but Jesus actually wants us to know and experience what it means to grow spiritually as well as emotionally and physically. So we're going to look through several small snippets, several small stories in Luke chapter 9, which are going to help us explore the idea particularly of growing spiritually. So if you have your Bible open, we'll start in Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. And it says this, and he called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there, depart. And whenever... And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So in this passage, Jesus sends out his 12 original disciples. And they're going out on their own for the first time. He sends them out to do the things that he has shown them that they can do by the power of the Holy Spirit. And two weeks ago, we saw him make a promise to the first couple of disciples that he called to be his disciples, Simon and Andrew. He said this, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So these 12 men were called to become fishers of men, to make more followers of Jesus. But in the beginning, they had no idea what that meant and how they could get started actually doing that. They needed to grow first. Now, my son Jordan is six foot, six inches, and change tall. He's actually sitting in the back because he doesn't want anyone to sit behind him and not be able to see. So when he was growing, there was a season between his 15th birthday and his 16th birthday where he grew 11 inches. My wife said, doesn't that just sound painful? If we kept feeding him, and we did, he kept growing and our bank account kept shrinking. Now, fortunately, at 21, we hope, we think that he might have reached his peak of physical maturity. And you and I know that every single child grows as long as they are well cared for and as long as they don't have some kind of unusual medical condition because physical growth is automatic, but spiritual growth is not. Spiritual growth requires intentional, constant work. 
Now, last week I quoted from one of my favorite discipleship books. It's called Disciple Shift, and it's written by Jim Putnam and a couple of other guys who were part of his team. And Putnam, and who's a pastor in Idaho, and his team poured over the New Testament, and they were looking specifically for examples of people in different stages of spiritual growth. And they identified five stages that Christ followers can experience on the road to spiritual maturity. Each of those five stages follows the previous one, but you and I, we don't move linearly. We don't always go from stage one to stage two to stage three. Sometimes we back up or we move back and forth across several stages. And sometimes some of us don't actually move at all. So in Luke 9, we're going to see some quick little snippets that tell us or give us examples rather of all five stages, but they don't appear in the order that this, of maturity. And so we're going to jump back and forth in Luke chapter 9 to illustrate all five of those things. So look at verses 7 through 9 of Luke chapter 9. It says, Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening, and he was perplexed, because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. Herod said, John, I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. So in verses 1 through 6, we see Jesus sending out his 12 disciples. And then there's this uh, very strange change of venue here, and we go to Herod the Tetrarch, and he is curious about all that is happening. So who was Herod, and what is it speaking of that was happening? Herod the Great who is not the Herod named in this story, was the king at the time Jesus was born. And he ruled over the area that we now think of as nor the northern portion, well, from Jerusalem north of Israel. And so in, the, in that era, it was referred to as Judea, and it included Galilee, which the, was the area that we looked at, yes, or rather last Sunday. And when he died... Uh, he had 14 kids that he acknowledged. And when he died, his territory was broken up, split up by the Roman Caesar Augustus and handed off to three of his sons as well as a granddaughter. But his three sons were named, as was the custom, Herod also. So we have Herod Archelaus, Herod Antipas, and Herod Philip II. Imagine what uh, Herod the Great's wife had to do to call one of them. Name off that whole name to get the right one there. But when the territory was split up, there was some contention among the brothers. The Herod in this story is actually the middle one, Herod Antipas. Now his family was what we might think of as the Kardashian family of the day. If there had been social media, he would have been posting on Instagram every eight minutes. If there had been reality TV, they would have followed his great family all around Israel as they went into all kinds of situations. But he divorced his first wife shortly after Herod Philip divorced his first wife, and Herod Antipas married Philip's first wife. Now, John the Baptist publicly denounced that marriage, called it adultery. And that, of course, didn't sit very well with Herod Antipas or with Herodias, his wife. And so, over a period of time, that contention led to John being uh, actually put into prison and then, put, and then executed. He was beheaded. So in this verse, when Antipas says, John, I beheaded, that's what he's speaking of. But verse 7 says, Herod heard all that was happening, and he was perplexed. So what was happening? Jesus was happening. Jesus was becoming known. He was teaching, he was healing, he was doing miracles, and now word was spreading that those who followed him were showing some of the same behaviors, the teaching and the healing that Jesus had done. 
And so there were people saying, well, maybe this Jesus guy is John the Baptist come back from the dead. Or maybe he's the Old Testament prophet Elijah or somebody else who's been sent back by God to bring us a message. Now, Herod, he was well aware of all these things, all these rumors, and so he was puzzled and he wanted to see Jesus. And Herod was an example of someone who's in stage one of spiritual maturity. Herod was actually spiritually dead. What does that mean? In the book of Ephesians, in chapter 2, in verses 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul talks about what it means to be spiritually dead. He says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So the Bible tells us every single one of us began this life as someone who was spiritually dead in our trespasses and our sins. And that's a really hard concept for us to wrap our brains around because we know we weren't physically dead. And so the idea of being spiritually dead seems kind of controversial and hard to understand. According to Paul, a spiritually dead person lives for his or her own passions and desires, not God's. Herod, clearly, based on the descriptions that we have of him from scripture and secular records, lived for his own passions and desires. Now, spiritually dead people may be curious about Jesus, but they don't necessarily want to follow him. Herod wanted to see Jesus, but he really wasn't interested in following Jesus at all. How do we know that? Well, much later in the book of Luke, in chapter 23, verse 8, Luke tells us when Herod finally saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So Herod wanted to see Jesus because he wanted to be entertained by Jesus not to follow Jesus. And that's one sign of a person who is spiritually dead. They have a skewed view of who Jesus is and what he's there for. And they tend to think of him as kind of this cool, hip dude who's very laid back, who always has the perfect snarky answer for a self-righteous religious person. And then he probably high fives the sinners after that when he says the snarky thing and then goes and hangs out at all the coolest parties. To the spiritually dead person, Jesus is a buddy appear even, nearly an equal, perhaps a little more enlightened, but nearly an equal, never a master, and certainly never someone to be followed or obeyed with wholehearted commitment. There's another way we can identify a spiritually dead person as well, and we can, we can identify them according to Jesus by the kind of things they say about God, about themselves, about their relationship to God. In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, Jesus said this, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So Jesus is essentially saying here, you can tell what stage or condition a person is in spiritually by what comes out of her heart by way of her mouth. 
And when Jesus makes a contrast between a good and an evil person, he's not talking about good versus evil on the surface level, the way we are. If someone asked you, are you good or evil? You'd probably instinctively say good, even though you know in your heart that you are a sinner. But Jesus makes clear in the very next verse in that particular part of Luke, what he meant by good. In Luke 6, 46, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? So a good person is a person who's following, obeying Jesus Christ. Something only a person who's been genuinely saved from his sin by receiving salvation through Jesus Christ's death on the cross, a spiritually alive person. A spiritually dead person doesn't obey Jesus. And you can recognize them by the kind of things they say. They might say, I don't really think I need to believe in God, or I'm sure there's many ways to God or heaven or whatever might come after this life, or, you know, I'm a pretty good person. If there is a God, I'm convinced he's probably okay with me the way that I am. I don't need to obey or follow God. All I need to do is believe that he's real. Now, it's a little disingenuous to call, a, to call spiritually dead an actual stage of spiritual maturity or spiritual growth because dead things can't grow. But this essentially uh, sets the foundation for the other stages and helps us see how people move from one to the other. If a spiritually dead person is introduced to Jesus and receives salvation from him, repents, believes, and receives, then something changes and he enters a new stage of spiritual growth. And this is a stage where growth can actually occur. Stage two is a spiritual infant. We find spiritual infants in this passage of scripture too. Look at Luke chapter nine, verses 10 and 11. It says, on their return, pardon me, the apostles <clears throat> told him all that they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him. And he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. So in the first part of Luke chapter 9, we see the apostles, the disciples, be sent out by Jesus. And they came back, they tell him what has happened, they're excited, but they're tired. And so uh, they, there's very large crowds there. We'll talk about how la large in just a moment. And when they returned, Jesus said, let's go away for a rest. We'll get away and have some time to ourselves. But the crowds found them. The crowds really wanted to see Jesus. And the people in the crowds were welcomed by Jesus. He continued the work, he taught and he healed them. And as he did, some of them believed. And the ones who believed were spiritual infants. The book of John tells us, uh, describes at least seven different crowd scenes in which the phrase, many believed, is used to describe the response of people in the crowd. But these are people who are just beginning to figure out who Jesus is. Most in the crowd were still spiritual infants. A spiritual infant is a Christian who needs to be continually fed the bare basic truths of faith in Jesus. Now, it's not a bad thing to be fed the basic truth about faith in Jesus. How does salvation work? Why do we need it? Who is Jesus? Why did he come? What did he do? Those are incredibly important Truths, and we must be reminded of them over and over again. In fact, in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 2, it says, Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. So Peter there is saying, Like babies, you need to long for the basic truths of the spiritual life in Christ. Learning those and knowing them well is absolutely critical. But notice, Peter also says, you may grow up. We should grow up. And if we don't, eventually God begins to knock on the inside door and say, are you there? Are you paying attention? 
And we find verses like Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. So just like physical infancy, spiritual infancy is actually meant to last only a short period of time. We're supposed to grow up. But many churches are filled with people who, although they may have been Christians for decades, are still feeding themselves from the sippy cups of faith. Just like those who are spiritually dead, you can recognize a spiritual infant by the kind of things that they say. They might say, you know, I don't really need a church or other Christians. I can do this life just me and God. Or, you know, I don't really need to read the Bible. I know the important parts. Or I'm sure Jesus is okay with my lifestyle choices. After all, he made me that way, right? Or I think the church is really here to care for me. And the crowds that followed Jesus included many who believed, but it was all very, very new to them. And it was all about them. And they needed to be encouraged to grow. They needed to see God's word taught and modeled. And every spiritual infant since that day needs the same thing. Now, those who move past spiritual infancy come to stage three, and they become a spiritual child. And think about what kind of things mark a child's behavior. Oftentimes, children are naturally joyful or innocent. They are trusting and they're inquisitive. But on the flip side, they're also very self-centered very focused on getting what they want the way they want it right now. A spiritual child can be known by the things that he or she says too. A spiritual child might say, my church isn't meeting my needs, so I'm going to find a different one. Or I hope my life group doesn't grow. I like it small so I can know everybody. Or why don't they ever play the music I want? Chad, why don't they ever play the music I want? Or maybe I'm not going to serve anymore because no one appreciates me. We find behaviors of spiritual children in this part of Luke also. So look at Luke chapter 9, verse 12. The crowds had found Jesus. He welcomed them, taught them, and healed them, and they kept on coming. It says, now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. So the crowd had gotten pretty big, and we'll find out how big in just a moment. But back in verse 10, the disciples had just returned from an assignment, and they, they tried to get away. They tried to actually have some rest time in a village named Bethsaida, but then the crowd found them, and Jesus worked all day. Now, he was probably tired, more tired than the disciples, but the disciples were tired too. And so they had been promised rest, and they did not want to have to care for the crowd's physical needs. So they went to Jesus, and they said, hey, Jesus, did you notice it's getting kind of late? There's still a lot of people here. It's too late to call food trucks. We didn't book a hotel banquet hall. Uh, we don't really have a lot of cash, so can we just call it an evening, and can you send those people away? Now, why did they say that? I mean, they just came back from phenomenal ministry where they themselves were used by Jesus, and they'd watched Jesus all day long do incredible things with this crowd. They said it because their faith was still relatively immature, and they wanted what they thought was best for them the way they wanted it right then. And what they thought was best for them was that they wouldn't have to solve a big problem. They wouldn't have to get involved with feeding a whole bunch of people. That's a sign of a spiritual child. We want what's best for us to not have to handle things that are difficult. We want Jesus just to fix them 
or take them away. And although you and I and everybody else who's ever been a follower of Jesus has begun life at first as a spiritual infant and then as a spiritual child, Jesus doesn't want us to stay in those stages. He wants us to be mature, to grow in our faith and our belief and our actions. And so we see Jesus engaging and training his disciples to develop maturity when we go back to the beginning of Luke chapter 9, where verses 1 through 6. The 12 disciples that Jesus sent out in this story were different than the 12 he called. Not different individuals, but different in the sense that they had begun to mature. When Jesus first called them, they were just trying to discover who he was and what he wanted. But by the time he sends them out, they're much more enthusiastic. They have embraced his teaching. They have begun to have faith in him and to understand what he wants them to do. Verses 1 and 2 again say this, And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And then if you jump back down to verse 6, it says they departed and went through the villages preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So Jesus said, I think you guys are ready. It's time for you to try this out. Go and do the things you've seen me do. And they did because they were growing spiritually. If he had said that on day one when he first called them, they would have panicked and they probably would have gone back to their jobs. But they'd begun to mature, to move to the next level of spiritual maturity. And at that moment, they were starting to enter stage four, which is a spiritual adult. But remember I said at the beginning, we move back and forth between stages. We rarely stay put in one for consistent periods of time. We tend to waver and take a couple steps backward and then take three steps forward. And there's something else we should know is there's actually two stages of spiritual adulthood. These young men were still in early spiritual adulthood. So you might say they were spiritual young adults. What are spiritual young adults like? Well, the book of 1 John chapter 2, verse 14 directly addresses a group of young men who fit the description. John said this, I write to you, young men, because you're strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. So the young men John addressed had some signs that he had seen of spiritual adulthood. And it could be seen in three things. First, their faith in Jesus was strong. It was unshakable. The challenges and struggles that they were facing didn't weaken their resolve to follow him faithfully. Second, they had spiritual, or scriptural rather, literacy. It said, John says, you abide in God's word. They knew what scripture said. They knew what Jesus said. And they made their decisions based not on what they felt was best in their rational, logical way, but they made decisions based on what it actually said in scripture and what Jesus had taught. Third, they had overcome the evil one, John says. So they had sin resistance that was becoming strong, stronger and stronger. They had learned to win the daily battles against temptation that Satan was constantly throwing at them and that he constantly throws at us. And the same things were beginning to be true about the disciples of Jesus when he sent them out on their first mission. So back in Luke chapter 9, verse 3, he says this, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, bag, bread, money, and no extra clothes. They had to be strong in faith. They had to believe that God was faithful and that he would provide. And in verse 5, Jesus says, And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. This weekend was my daughter Peyton's uh, final end of the season dance recital. It was uh, a whole bunch of dancers. It was a three hour production. It was really extremely well done. Um, There was a theme through the whole thing, the story. Um, But in the middle of it, my daughter Peyton danced with her class a couple of times. And one of the times that they danced, they danced to Taylor Swift's Shake It Off. So every time I read this verse this weekend, 
and I saw it shake off the desk. I was going, shake it off, shake it off. <laughs> and you can thank me later for putting that song in your head, and it won't go away for the next 24 hours. So shaking the dust off your feet was actually a first century custom that showed your dismissal of or your relinquishment of responsibility for a group or a town or a house that had refused to honor you or to follow what you had taught or to show you hospitality. It was a fairly significant, drastic kind of insult. And Jesus said, shake the dust off your feet as you leave a house or a town that has rejected you. He's telling them, prepare to be rejected. This is going to happen. And you cannot make your decisions based on whether or not they're going to reject you. You must base your decisions on what you have already seen in the Word of God, and Jesus would say, in my teaching. So there's the second sign of their spiritual young adulthood. And then Jesus also told his disciples how to overcome the evil one. He sent them out to cast out demons and to heal people from diseases. That was a direct assault on Satan, the evil one. And they came back excited to tell what had happened. So in those moments, even though they later fell back into kind of the child stage, when they said, send these people away, in those moments where they were sent out, they were demonstrating evidence that they had become a spiritual adult. Now, how do you and I recognize a spiritual adult in this era? Again, you recognize them by the kind of things they say. They might say to you, hey, you know, I was reading my Bible the other day, and this thing stuck in my head, and I wanted to tell you about it. Or, hey, I, I heard that guy who came up and stood on stage at the beginning of the service ask if any of us wanted to go to Latin America and be a missionary, and something perked up in me, and I'm going to go talk to him about that. Or, I love serving in that ministry, even when it's hard and no one seems to appreciate it. Or maybe I haven't seen Tim and Tina in my small group for a while. I think I'll call, instead of the small group leader, I'll call them and see how they're doing and maybe have them over for dinner. The clearest signs that you are entering spiritual adulthood is you're orienting your thinking and your words and your action around the things that God has made clear he wants to accomplish in and through you. And to do that, you need accountability, you need boundaries, you need mentoring. And at this church, we are committed to providing those, and we can help you grow in that, in that stage if you would like to pursue them. And if you choose to do so, you might actually move to stage five, which is the stage of being a spiritual parent. Now, the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, describes one of the key characteristics of a spiritual parent. In that letter to Timothy, Paul says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So a spiritual parent is someone who has moved past just needing to be fed himself and is beginning to also feed others. She is training people to do the things that she has learned to do. If a Christian is capable of those kinds of feeding of others, that training and that preparing and helping others to grow in that way, and doesn't, then the best you can claim is to be a spiritual young adult and you have not yet reached full maturity. Now, in the main passage that we're looking at today, Jesus sent out his disciples on the mission, and they did what he said, and it was so amazing that even Herod, this pagan king, heard about the kind of things that were happening in the, in the area. And so they came back to tell Jesus about it. They went to rest. The crowd found them. Jesus taught and healed all day. The disciples reverted back to spiritual children and said, please send them away so we don't have to deal with it. They need food. And so Jesus does something unexpected. Look at verses 13 through 17. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. I'm going to say that again. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. They said, ah, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we are to go and buy food for all these people 
for there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. When the disciples asked Jesus to send the crowd home, Jesus said, you feed them. And with that statement, he confirmed what spiritual maturity actually looks like. Not only are you being fed, but you are feeding them as well. If you are a churchgoer, you've heard this feeding of the 5,000 story a million times probably, and I, I have too. And I, I'll be honest with you, whenever I heard this story, I always thought that question, why don't you feed them, was a setup. It was like, I want you to realize you're clueless and you can do nothing. And so this is just a setup to show you what the Son of God is capable of doing. Well, he was demonstrating the power of the Son of God. He was demonstrating who he was, God in the flesh. But at the same time, he was trying to get through their heads what their mission as a follower of Jesus Christ is. You feed them. Now, they reverted, like we all do, back to earlier stages of spiritual maturity. But they also moved forward. And as we look at the story of the disciples over the course of Scripture and what it tells us about them, we see an ever-increasing level of spiritual maturity. Those 12 men were spiritually dead when they met Jesus. They went from infants to children to young adults who could be sent out on his mission. And Jesus expected them to continue to mature so that they could feed others. Today is Father's Day, and dads, today is your day. Uh, you're probably going to receive a gift or two, some cards, some phone calls. You may get a special meal, and you should be honored for what you do. You give your time, you give your attention, you give your love, you give your protection, you, give your, you provide for them. You do all those things, and you do it well, and you should be honored. But the truth is, the best gift that you can give to your children is to be, in addition to their physical parent, be their spiritual parent. Be deeply involved in feeding your kids so that they can mature as future men and women who are disciple-making followers of Jesus Christ. Have you discovered a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you connected to a few caring, like-minded fellow believers? And are you growing in maturity? Will you bow your heads? Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge to grow. Thank you for uh, just showing us the examples of real people like us who take three steps backward and then two steps forward and feel like often that we'll never make any significant pro progress and sometimes think, I don't even know which direction to go. Lord, we know that you provide answers when we reach out to you with our hearts uh, held out, knowing that you want us to grow in maturity. We pray that you will point us to opportunities to do that growing and that you will also show us ways to help feed others. Fill this church with men and women who want to serve you in that capacity and help us to grow so that we have that capability. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with us and we'll sing our last song together. You are not alone. 
If you are lonely when you feel afraid, you're not the only. We are all the same in need of mercy to be forgiven and be free. It's all you've got to lean on, but thank God it's all you need. And other people said amen. Whoa, when all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. If you're rich or poor, well, it don't matter. Weak or strong, you know love is what we're after. We're all broken, but we're all in this together. God knows we stumble and fall. And he so loved the world, he sent his son to save us all. And all the people said amen. Whoa, and all the people said amen. Thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit and the torn apart. Blessed are the people hungry and the pure in heart. Blessed are the people hungry for another star. But theirs is the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And all the people said amen. Oh, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. And all the people said amen. Oh, and all the people said amen. Thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. And all the people said amen. So thanks for being with us here today on Father's Day. If you're wondering if this was a beer up on, on the table here, it's not. It's Dad's Root Beer. Those are in the back. They're cold. You're welcome to grab one on your way out. Any of you guys, uh, please take advantage of that. And I wanted to mention one other thing we didn't get announced. Um, this Saturday, we are launching a young adult group, uh, spiritual young adults. And so they're going to be meeting in the mornings, uh, 8.30 at the Fika Coffee House by Legend High School. And from there, they'll be planning future events. Uh, I don't see Jared, so um, is he here? Oh, there he is. Okay. So do you want to say anything else about it? Or? Okay. I didn't see you. Sorry, I would have invited you up. Okay. All right. One minute. One minute. Uh, yeah, so this Saturday uh, at 830, we're meeting at FICA right by the Legend High School. And uh, this is an opportunity for us just to meet together as young adults. I'm still considered a young adult, right? Um, <laughs> and so I'll be 27 in July. But anyways, uh, that's young, yes. Um, so we'll be meeting there and just discussing uh, a book together. You don't need the book right this Saturday, but we'll talk about what book we're going to buy. Uh, we're going to be going through the book. Uh, Radical by David Platt. It's a book that really influenced my life when I was in college. It really helped me see a world perspective of Christianity. And I think it's a book that's needed today, uh, how we as young adults can live uh, radically for Christ. And so we want to uh, talk about that. What does that mean? And also just share life together and have some fun things as well. So that's this Saturday at 830. We'll be meeting every other Saturday, um, but we're going to start off this Saturday at, at 830. Cool. You can stay here. We'll pray. Father God, thank you so much for bringing us together on this Father's Day. We just ask that you bless each of the men in this room who has the responsibility for guiding a family, uh, young men and women who are under their care 
and uh, who they are challenged to raise up as followers of your son, Jesus. So we pray for the strength and the discernment and the wisdom to do that. And we pray uh, for all the things that are happening here at the church. We thank you for this new group that is starting. And we pray that it will kick off with a big bang and that it will be an exciting opportunity to see young men and women who love you growing in maturity. And Lord, we pray for Dan and his family as they serve in Latin America. We pray that you will continue to bless their ministry. Challenge us, Lord, to become involved in real and tangible ways. Thank you for blessing us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.